Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the Dataversity webinar series, Data Insights and Analytics, brought to you in partnership with First San Francisco Partners. Today, Kelly O'Neill and John Ladley will discuss data-centric analytics and understanding the full data supply chain. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DIAnalytics. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce two of our speakers for today. Joan is a business technology thought leader and recognized enterprise information management authority. His 30 years of experience including planning, project management, implementation information systems, and improving IT functions, John writes and speaks on a variety of topics and enjoys sharing his expertise on strategic planning, data governance, and practical technology applications that solve business problems. Kelly O'Neill is the founder and CEO of First San Francisco Partners, an information management consulting firm. She is a veteran industry leader, speaker, author, and trainer. Kelly is passionate about helping companies leverage the value of data, empowering them to derive insights that inform decision making and improve results. And with that, I will turn it over to John and Kelly to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hi there. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. Hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> Just making sure you're there, John. I All am right. here. I am here. Excellent. Well, I today. I am ready to go. Fantastic. Well, today we're going to talk about uh, data centric analytics. You know, you might have, for those of you in the audience, you might have heard us speak about the data centric development lifecycle in the past and how to pull data to the forefront of your development life cycles. In fact, I think John actually presented on that topic uh, most recently here at EDW. Um, but today, we're going to talk specifically about data-centric analytics and how to leverage the concept of a data supply chain to ensure that your product actually provides you the results that you're seeking as you think through that uh, concept of, a, of an analytics life cycle. So uh, I love this um, topic, and part of the reason is because of the analogy to the supply chain. And looking at best practices from a supply chain perspective can really help us consider ways in which we can think about quality assurance and some of the uh, techniques that help product organizations optimize their materials and product lifecycle management. Um, so for today's webinar, we're going to talk about that data supply chain and what is a data supply chain, how it impacts analytics, and then we'll go into some of those design considerations, again, leveraging the thought process of a supply chain environment. So hopefully some of you on the phone are within supply chain companies and that you'll really appreciate this analogy that we're working on today. Um, and with that, I'm actually going to turn some of the slides over to John based on his experience in supply chain businesses and some of the manufacturing experience that he's had to help articulate that analogy that we've got. So John, why don't you go ahead and start with some of this background information? I uh, will do. Thank you very much, Kelly. Um, it's, uh, so here's a couple of examples we, we, we found, and we have some sources cited there that you can actually go to and find lots more examples. Uh, an insurance company uh, doing their data science thing, and they've got a predictor that they thought was really amazing that they could help uh, say that this person was thinking of canceling their policy, and we could mark it directly to them, and they did this analysis and uh, sent uh, lots of uh, mails uh, uh, and emails out to these uh, folks to get them to um, extend or renew, and it turned out the indicator was actually a cancellation indicator, and they were actually telling people to renew something they had canceled, which was rubbing salt in the wound. Um, uh, uh, a real estate A model was uh, corrupted because um, uh, and it was deemed unuseful because there was an error in there that only one record in a million, but you might have a magnitude of a thousand. Now, you might say, well, that's a lot, but in real estate, when you're dealing with 
millions of transactions that can range from a few thousand dollars to hundreds of millions of dollars, you have no reasonable range check available to you. Um, and the model was unable to support that because there had been no reasonableness applied during the uh, processing of all this data. Um, in the healthcare business, um, almost everything is affected by how the electronic health record is built now. And any omission, any change in that can skew healthcare results and healthcare anal analytics drastically. This is a serious problem because we're beginning to use uh, uh, conclusions from analytic models and AI uh, and via machine learning for diagnosis support. And you don't have to be um, uh, uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and at the top of your game to realize that that could be problems with the patient. Um, we all know that we never get our email right or an address right. And that's because at any one time, 20 to 23% of all emails and addresses are absolutely wrong because y'all are moving around and it's hard to draw a bead on that. There's lots of examples of what can go with data that will affect your results, right? We all know this. Uh, there's a website that uh, I like to just pop into once in a while, towardsdatascience.com. It's pretty sophisticated, but every so often there are some real gems on that website uh, for uh, things that can that uh, drive your analytics off the rails. So this metaphor of a supply chain is really very powerful. We're talking about engineering your data movement to support the consumer of that data. I, uh, you know, a data scientist will, can be very proud of what they do and they can dampen out data issues through statistical methods, but at the end of the day, there is very, there are very few data scientists that will tell you they really enjoy spending all this time uh, recrafting and repositioning and restaging data to make it useful for their model. So here's a way to do it that the entire organization can benefit from, and it is a powerful engineering-based metaphor, so it makes it easier for you to sell and, and understand how to do it. So with that, uh, uh, we will go on and actually talk about some data supply chains. So what is it exactly? Well, well, as I said, it's a metaphor. So uh, the best way to talk about it is what is it a metaphor to? Well, it's the regular supply chain, which is the coordination of material, the sourcing and assembling and the movement and stuff so that you can deliver goods or services to a customer. And if I was making a washing machine, um, uh, uh, or a car or any hard good. I have steel and aluminum, and that's my raw material, but that has to be managed in some way. We have uh, uh, the parts. We have other parts we would acquire. We might not build our motors. We would might acquire those from somebody. And then we're going to fabricate our raw materials, and we go through some type of sequencing and processing here to uh, assemble things. And then there's the distribution part of the supply chain, which is how does the consumer get it? or where do we store it or position it uh, so that it can, can be acquired at another time. Uh, we're pretty much all familiar with this. Well, the data supply chain does something very similar, and we all do this now. Everyone, whether you think you have an elegant uh, ETL and data movement or you're populating your data lake with some sophisticated tools, um, everyone from uh, in, your, in any organization, for-profit, non-for-profit, government, non-government, does this now. You have a data supply chain. So we're not talking about building anything new. We're talking about understanding what you have and making it work better. All right? So for my data, I have internal databases and data that I might derive or um, uh, uh, treat or, or update along the way. I can also acquire raw materials. I can get a file that might be the similar of a component part. It's not something I make, but I need it. Um, I can clean and standardize it, and that's my fabrication step there. Um, then as I do my assembly, I might put a sandbox out there, and I will develop and run my models, and that gives me my product. But there's the distribution, or what we would call data accessing, or publish and subscribe type things um, where s folks can use it, uh, visualize it, um, or we might want to monetize our data. We would want to sell the results of that. 
So that's the full metaphor explained. Um, uh, um, Kelly, any comments or questions on that before I go ahead? Any, any additional thoughts? I think that the way to be thinking about the uh, part that this data supply chain is, as you said, it's, it's kind of a, it's a model and it's an analogy. And it's a way to think about how we look at the um, uh, process as the data moves around our organization to really consider what quality means at different points and what analytics means at different points. So anyway, just a way that, that you consider that and also you consider uh, how you can leverage some of the uh, best practices and um, optimization that your company may uh, strive for within your supply chain to talk about how you would do something similar in your data supply chain to ensure that your analytics um, have the same amount of attention as possibly the product creation process within your supply chain. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, you know, we're going to talk about this a little more detail in a few more slides, but um, if you have in mind the entire time you're building your data lake for analytics that you are going, even if you're not going to officially monetize your data, if your mindset is, I'm going to sell this, someone external is going to scrutinize me because of this, you're going to have a much better result. So let's just talk about why this is important. Um, uh, you know, try to imagine something without this, this metaphor. Uh, and we have this. We have this now when someone says, yes, we have operational systems and we do things with our data. Then we go into the data lake and we do some stuff and the models aren't right. Well, it's because you haven't put some discipline on this. And it's, it's that simple, all right? So I have my factory and uh, I've been uh, fortunate or unfortunate. It depends on what you like. I always was very energized by my work in manufacturing. But um, there's a parts and tools uh, crib or, 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 or cage. And in that cage, everything is very, very uh, well uh, managed. Um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me here. Um, uh, so if I am one of the workers on the floor and I go to the cage and ask for a, um, uh, a tool or a bolt or a fastener, uh, they will go get it and inventory will be decremented and they know right where to get where, where to get all of that. Um, that's because there's a lot of policy, there's a lot of lean management and thoughts have gone into that. There's strong guidance, there's strong policies around that type of thing. There is an inventory control system and there's an item ester. Well, what we talk about a lot on our conferences here and our webinars are metadata and data governance. Your inventory control system and your item master are your metadata and your data governance. So your, your data, um, imagine it's in a crib and I want to go get it and I need to know right where to go to get it. Yeah, that's an inventory control system. That's exactly how an inventory control system works. So Tell me anything? Going, I, heard, I, heard, I heard an intake of air. Exactly. <laughs> yes, that's right. And so with some of that kind of inventory control system, so how does, how does a manufacturing or um, organization ensure that they uh, understand where that part ends up going? Do they, do they validate who, with, who takes it out of the cage or, or what right. is that tracking process? Oh, yeah, that, that's right. Um, uh, good one. Uh, the way it works nowadays uh, um, uh, is uh, you'll scan your ID at, at the tool crib or the parts crib, and uh, then someone, then you'll stick your nose and ask for something, and or you'll have some type of requisition, or even some line controllers already sent a request into the crib, and you're just going over there to pick it up and carry it back to the station. Mm -hmm. But either way, there is there is a, there is a, a built-in lineage that you uh, ahead of time. Where how is this material supposed to flow? And it is documented, and then you match. You make sure that your request matches that defined process. And of course, all the material now, except the most primitive or raw materials, have an RFID tag on them. And when you walk out of the crib, it's scanned and it is an inventory is decremented and it is put into the in-process cost. So um, 
all of this stuff is exactly what we talk about when we want really robust data lineage and we really want to know where the data comes from and GDPR tells companies you must know who touches it and all of that kind of stuff. In fact, I, could, I just, just popped into my head, we can extend the GDPR requirement for right to be forgotten, right? Mm -hmm. That's no different than we had a part go out and it's no, no good from the manufacturer. Where is it? Where is it used? We need to pull it out of the line. Uh, we can do that in manufacturing or especially consumer products. Let's say romaine lettuce, for example, <laughs> just as a wild example here. Every, you know exactly or you should know exactly where that is. So th there is that part, that item's right to be forgotten is a day in, day out table stakes functionality. And what we're saying with this, with using this metaphor, doesn't make a right to be forgotten or right to remove anything a big, huge problem. You engineer this stuff the right way and it's not a big deal. And, you know, we're starting to see people think this way in our practice, which is why we're kind of diving really deep into this metaphor today. That's great. Thanks. So so another reason is 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 well we talked about this manufacturing product. You know, um if we talk about the lettuce or we have a, a car that gets recalled or something, but suppose you put out a bad model. Well, right now, you know, you, you go with your hat in your hand to the, to an executive desk and say, hey, you know that model that said all your customers would buy this stuff. Well, they really aren't going to buy this stuff because the model was wrong. Uh, you don't want to do that. You want to know ahead of time who's going to be affected and what might might do that. Um, uh, uh, we do this a lot with data. And uh, again, this type of thinking really helps your governance uh, functions as well as your data management functions. When I go and get a new supplier in a manufacturing uh, business. I, I, some of you know this and Kelly knows this for sure. I have a hobby of restoring air, old airplanes and I will, sometimes my good old reliable supplier won't have that part I need and I go to another supplier and it never ever fits the same way that the old supplier had it because there's always some subtle difference even if the specifications are the same. Now we do that with data all the time why not use that mindset that the specs might not be right to then understand and see if the part we've ordered or external data we've signed a contract for is actually going to fit the process. Again, it, you know, when you think this way, you, it's really easy to put in uh, processes and capacities and capabilities that, that act in this way with your, your data. Um, it's, uh, I think we got, yeah, there we go. So like modern manufacturing, what you're really going for is not quality control. So for those of you out there listening that are in consumer products or manufacturing, you know that about 25, 30 years ago, our mind shift, minds shifted from quality control, which is after it comes out the end of the building, someone looks at it and says, that's not right. And it goes over and gets fixed. Now it's quality assurance. Let's fix the process so that when it comes out the end of the building, we know it's going to be right. That mindset is what gave us Kaizen and Lean and Six Sigma and all those kinds of things. And we're saying, let's apply that to your, your data. We have a client right now that has a very active, robust, lean management system in place. Um, they're not getting a separate data governance program. They're getting a data governance program that is being inserted in alongside and part of their lean system. Be so we're just taking their uh, internal process improvements uh, with all of their flow of, of um, sorry, goods and services within their organization, and we're making data part of that mindset of lean improvement. Um, so, you know, you fix the process, you build the data supply chain, you don't just fix it at the end because everyone knows we spend 80% of our time fixing this stuff at the end. The, the, the economics are irrefutable. Change the process so you don't have to do that. So then what, what does that look like, John? What's that approach well, to do that? Well, the number, you know, the, the way it's manifested for most part, folks, would be the easy example is data quality, right? 
um, we 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 realize that we're uh, we're trying to run models and data dimensions are incorrect, and we find out that somewhere back way up in some operational system, uh, a data entry process uh, is resulting in um, a, a bit of data with uh, erroneous codes on it. Um, so to use, to continue our manufacturing, someone put the wrong product type or the wrong color code or the wrong size code on it. And then we do an analysis on the data and we want to do an analysis on uh, shipping costs for very large items. And because the data is coded incorrectly, um, we do an analysis on stuff that would fit in a shoebox and shouldn't have been in the analysis in the first place. Uh, a story I tell very, very often is one of the, the in most inexpensive high return uh, data changes I've ever been part of was a sticky note to tell data entry operators don't enter all nines in certain fields because that's what they were doing to get their job done quicker and go home sooner. So so we, you know, that those are the kind of things that that is fixing the process versus at the end going, oh, the data scientist says, well, the dimensionality is wrong here. I'm going to create a formula and spend weeks doing it that looks at all of the contextual other data and imputes or implies what that data dimension should be. And the data scientists love doing that, but they're very expensive. I don't want to pay them to do that. I want to pay them to do the analytics. So I think the data quality is probably your number one shining example. Does that, does that help, Kelly? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, all right. Um, time check here. And, and um, we are uh, just make sure people know that we do love answering questions and endeavor to answer them uh, all we can. There are some questions coming in already. Um, uh, and there's one that I can't wait to answer. I just thought, oh boy, let's hurry up and get to the end. So we can get to this, can get to this question. It's a really, really good one. Uh, well, so let's keep going, but please ask questions. Uh, I know a lot of you are out there going, well, how do I keep, uh, how do I sell this? How does I position it? They, I, I, you know, we can't use these words. Um, we can't use data governance anymore. We can't use EIM anymore. Well, you know, use data supply chain, all right? Something, something along those lines. Now, uh, so the next thing is we've got this analogy down. Now, how do you think, how do you apply all of this? Well, first, we call this data-centric thinking, and you've heard Kelly and I talk about this before, of a data-centric uh, systems life cycle and data-centric projects. You, you think differently than you do with a software product or something like that. The first thing is data is an asset, and you treat it as such. Now, we're not going to do that. There is a bit of a philosophical argument going on now that data in the uh, balance sheet type asset should or should not be considered. And that's not what we're saying here. What we're saying is, look, just pretend it's really, really important and you're not going to treat it as badly as you've been treating it. It is an asset is important to your organization. So that's the first part of data centric thinking. The second is everyone you are supplying data to Remember, they are going to do something with that data for somebody else they're working with. So you are not selling to a consumer. That data does not stop when someone picks up the report. They're going to pick up that report or the result of that data, of that analytical model, and they're going to turn around and take action on it. You are selling to a supplier, not a consumer. And even though a consumer can complain, when you're doing, but if you're in a complicated business model where you sell to somebody who's reselling at to somebody else and you make them look bad to their customer, trust me, you'd rather have a mad consumer than somebody that you have messed up their, their supply chain, all right? So your mindset should be you're selling to a supplier who has a job to do with that and you want to help them do the best job they can do. All right, it, it, that is a subtle mindset, but it makes a huge difference in how you focus on things for that person. You focus more on the utility of that versus just it's correct and it looks the way it's supposed to. It's actually actionable, usable data or information. 
Last, third thing you've got to keep in mind, your data strategy should reflect your business strategy. We've talked about this over and over again on these things. And you must integrate your data supply chain with a data strategy. If you don't have a data strategy, and a lot of folks really don't have one, you need one. If you have one, don't go off buying best of breed tools that do really cool things on their own and you haven't taken an overall look at the data strategy and you haven't taken the mindset to build an integrated data supply chain. Because um, if you get best of breed tools, there's a high likelihood that you will have a data supply chain where you need to do some extra engineering to connect the pieces together. The fourth um, item here is treat this like a real business line. Even if you're not monetizing the data, which would mean you're selling it, or looking for uh, explicit revenue streams from your data, or looking to explicitly reduce costs from your data, pretend you're doing it anyway. So AI and analytics and all of these architectures are really logistical challenges, getting the data to the right spot in the right way so it can be used effectively. So pretend this is a product, even if it's internal, and build out a data supply chain. Anything, Kelly, you're on, onward and upward. No, I think I think let's keep going because I, I love the idea of an architecture to be able to manage those logistical challenges uh, yeah, yeah, because it is it is logistical, right? It is. It, it, <laughs> yeah. it, it is. And, and, and I'm going to go back to our reference architecture here to start the conversation. Most organizations are complicated. Uh, um, uh, even smaller organizations, as we move into more midsize uh, or we get calls from midsize companies uh, as the whole analytics and uh, uh, machine learning trickles down into other organizations or even sophisticated data warehouse or whatever. Um, uh, there are off the shelf old packages, there's off the shelf new packages, there's homegrown things uh, and there's modern data assets. And the fact is that um, your architecture in the 21st century is going is complicated. There is no one with that simple, here's some source systems and we're gonna put the data and stage it and clean it up and then we're gonna use it and do great things. It's never that simple. So you have to be really practical about that. Well, again, building a data supply chain um, allows you to balance the movement between these vintage and contemporary sides of your architecture. I have a distribution and I have sourcing challenges, which I can take the time to identify all of my sources. What am I fabricating? What's raw material? What am I assembling? Who am I assembling it for? Let's, you know, remember that supplier mentality. And then how is it distributed? Is it push? Is it pull? Is it both? Um, all of those characteristics of the four basic simple stages of the supply chain. Uh, and by the way, I supplied pretty much the textbook basic four stages of a supply chain in there just to keep the, the discussion uh, cleaner today. Um, all of those are reflected in the movement of data and information throughout your architecture. You're moving from the vintage side to the contemporary side. You're moving from the contemporary side to the vintage. Are your vintage do you have supplies or sources on both sides? Maybe yes, maybe no. Are you fabricating data on both sides? Maybe yes, maybe no. You can see where you can almost build a matrix that will give you some good guidance as to what types of requirements you're gonna to have to position your data in the best way for the uh, uh, analytics layer. Remember that analytics layer is down at the bottom. So the vintage can feed into that, the contemporary can feed into that, um, but where is it coming from? And then define that and by way of definition, you've created some metadata and some implied policies uh, as well. And so that way, you know, managing your data architecture with this mindset gives you a more efficient architecture. I'm sorry, I had to pause for a drink of water there. Uh, okay. Um, so what are some of the features here? Let's dive into the supply chains uh, while we are um, um, uh, have our heads in around what these, what the various uh, functions and stuff are. 
in a regular goods and services supply chain, I have to worry about integrating all of my moving parts. I have to worry about good, efficient operations. I have to worry about the um, actual um, 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 uh, acquisition and purchasing my external items. Um, and then I have to worry about, of course, distribution. What goes where? And when is it supposed to get there? Of those four, probably integration is the heart and soul of, of a modern goods and services supply chain. Uh, that's your logistics function tends to be part there. And the capabilities that are within that, we have our, and in terms of maybe operational data systems, uh, uh, and Kelly can weigh in here, and your product type management type systems. Uh, your, your organization of how you do your operations, purchasing, there will be policies and compliance for purchasing, and then your logistics for your distribution. The data supply chain, instead of hard good integration, we have data integration, we have data operations, we have data management versus purchasing, and for data distribution, for distribution, we have the push and pull. Our essential capabilities are product management, as, as in managing the domain of product. There is an engagement model of how you work with the rest of the organization. Uh, governance takes the place of compliance and oversight. And BI and analytics or getting the data to who needs to see it becomes a logistical uh, issue, not, not strictly an access issue. Um, a typical data supply chain oversimplified uh, for, for uh, clarity here in our discussion would be creating the data. Someone uses it probably in an operational mindset. Um, along the way, it gets updated. Along the way, you're measuring your organization. You know, how many did we ship? Well, where did we ship it? Did they pay their bill? Those kinds of things. Um, from a data standpoint, is I create the data, I use it to do some type of operational report. I update the data as uh, my business model proceeds on a particular domain of data. I measure how we're doing, so I, how many products did I sell, how many customers did I sell to. Then I might build a model. That is model as an analytical model there, or not data model. I might do my analysis prescriptive, descriptive, predictive, whatever. And at the end of it, and this is where, boy, nobody thinks about this, but at some point we do have to delete it. We have an obsolete product. We don't want it on the shelf anymore. It costs more to keep it than it does to have it handy. Um, and for those of you that have had a good argument with your legal area on how long to keep data, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, um, so Kelly, uh, the, the metaphor of the, the functions and the capabilities, they really do line up, don't they? Yeah, they do, absolutely. And But I do think, though, that at some point, the data supply chain does start to deviate from the simplicity that we're talking about here in the sense that, and I'm just expecting some of the um, data savvy folks on the line to start asking questions uh, as they come up. For example, you can create the data, you can use the data, but even at that juncture, it might start to take a fork off of this nice yes. little linear chevron, right? And yes. so I know that this is leading into the next slide, but there are some uh, nuances about the data supply chain that uh, are both interesting around you know, why this analogy works, but also where the analogy doesn't necessarily map so cleanly how we want to address those sorts of things. So thinking that data does uh, move um, in a nonlinear way within the organization and then potentially externally to the organization. Yeah. So I know it's a lead into the next slide. But yeah, and, 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 it's, yeah. and this is a very simple example. If you mm -hmm. were to draw one of these for real in your organization, one way you would think about it, first of all, um, there might be one for every domain, right? You would probably have a customer supply chain and a product supply chain. You may have a metrics supply chain. Um, you could conceivably try to draw one that has 
all the data you're going to put into an analytical model. Um, it might look a little complicated, but that might be another way to, uh, to do this. Someone else made an observation in the chat, not a question, so I can talk about this now because it's a chat. And it shows that great minds think alike and how smart our audience is. Because when I was making this slide up to make it clean, I said it said originally delete and or archive. And I took that off to make it cleaner. And someone said, wait a minute, you should have and or archive on, <laughs> on the delete. So, so uh, they are watching us, Kelly. We have to be on. <laughs> as we know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as we, um, no, this is a very yeah, folks. This is a really simple example uh, to talk through it, and and we do know that these can get complicated. I have actually in the past um, uh, for uh, certain no, I can't, we don't have time to go into that today, but certain business situations where we have done a data supply chain design. We've actually done that type of engineering, and there's a lot of techniques and stuff that go into that, but we've had to define that for companies that were entering into a new realm or had a burning platform, and they had to totally reload their entire uh, applications portfolio. So uh, it's something that is done as a technique. We're just not using this as an analogy, but they can get pretty gnarly. Um, so anyway, to, to move forward here, we have let's talk about some of the components that you're going to see. These none of these will be really really uh, earth shaking, but we have our typical data supply chain and what some things you're going to have to have to manage it. First of all, governance, right? That capability needs to be there. Every what are the rules of interacting with that supply chain? What are the policies and parameters? that make that supply chain work the way it's supposed to work that. Of course, a big one along that way is data quality. That's, uh, as we said earlier with our analogy, that's your number one quality assurance step is data quality. And of course, uh, that requires a data catalog or metadata. And metadata is an absolute guaranteed requirement of a data supply chain. So we've got those good structural things. So if someone is telling you, we don't need governance, we don't need metadata, just go do the work. Just say, hey, okay, we're gonna build a data supply chain and we're gonna do whatever it takes to make that run efficiently. And they go, yay, or go ahead and do it. And then very quietly do your catalog and your governance because you have to do those anyway. They're not optional, all right? I mean, it's real clear about that one. Uh, so then we have our sources and sources can be legacy apps, ERPs type systems, off common, you know, uh, COTS type things and external files. We can land in our data lake where we can land and standardize in our analytics, but we can also have in parallel traditional BI reporting and or some hybrid of both of those. All right, so you kind of have your manufacturing uh, and fabrication and then to your distribution type thing. And these are the basic structures that you'll see along the way for those. Uh, not a whole lot of, uh, not a lot of surprises here, right? Yeah, but I do think, you know, one of the reasons that I wanted to raise that in the previous um, point is that some of these, you know, foundational building blocks on the bottom here are meant to address the nonlinear um, yeah. flow <laughs> of data, yeah. right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, because it's, it's not so nice and simple. And so as a way to uh, ensure that there is a... Um, uh, corralling and understanding of the data as it is uh, used and then analyzed, and then maybe it's updated after the analytics occur, et cetera, yeah. and it jumps around on the supply chain. Yeah, I, I really, um, and maybe when we touch on this topic again in the future, because I'm sure we will, is um, multiple rows of brown chevrons that come together at the right-hand side to the analytical model, because I'm going to combine product data, customer data, uh, transaction data, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Many, many, mm -hmm. many supply chains will get put into that model. Mm -hmm. No different than if I'm building a very, very complicated product like an automobile or a, 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 an aircraft carrier, right, or, or something like that. There's Yeah, there's a lot of complexity to that. Um, but at the core, to Kelly's point, if you don't have governance and a catalog and a mindset of data quality, it doesn't matter how much you talk about the supply chain is going to fall apart. 
you, you, you can't you can't manage it. Um, so some of the roles out here that you might see. Remember the mindsets we talked about, which is you know, that you're a, you, you're going to a supplier and you're thinking this is a product. So here's some you're going to need someone to be like the product manager. All right. So that's a person that might be uh, uh, you know is this suitable or is it right? Is it the right quality? Now some places we might call this a custodian or a steward. All right. But the mindset would be their kind of a product uh, uh, manager here. There is an architectural and an engineering type role, which is defining a supply chain from the source all the way through to the end. And that would be perhaps you're a, a data architect or an enterprise architect uh, of sort. Um, you need your governance and your quality role and someone to manage the data quality so the data scientists have a sustainable product and that you um, have the appropriate oversight in place to supply standards because like our tool crib, like our uh, parts crib, there are many, many standards in place. No one is going to argue over those because it is so obvious what the excess costs would be if you didn't have standardization, all right? Imagine building a car or anything with no standardization of fasteners. And just use that bolt. You know, if the, the bolt's bigger, drill a bigger hole. It, you, the chaos that would ensue would be amazing. And we do that with data every darn day, all right? So, uh, so we definitely need that role. And then lastly, leadership and alignment. And, and we kind of understate this. You need someone who, who, who sees it, first of all, the support mechanisms across all these data supply chains, across many domains, share very common capabilities. Leadership should be, yes, so we're going to find a place where we can keep all of those uh, monitored and managed and planned and uh, defined. And we're going to also make sure that we're integrated with the data strategy and vision for uh, the organization. Um, so the generic roles, and you can find the job titles for these in all the various types of data management and data governance uh, job titles we have. And then to take the, sorry, go back, and then to take that kind of back to the supply chain analogy, so obviously you would have a product manager. What are the equivalent sorts of titles for architect, engineer, governance, et cetera? Uh, enterprise architect would be a really good one. Um, a data no, meaning architect. from the product. Oh, on it's, the product side? Yeah, on the product side. Yeah, Who would it, be it, an architect in a product supply chain? Industrial engineers, mm -hmm. um, that's your number one uh, degree uh, that I've run into. Um, a logistics specialist is another one or someone with an advanced degree in logistics and they're called, I, I can never say the word right, logisticians, mm -hmm. all right. Um, uh, there's also um, uh, um, mechanical engineers, uh, also civil engineers, also, uh, those are the common uh, industry titles you'll see uh, out there um, for, for those equivalents. Got okay. it. All righty. Yeah. So now the responsibilities, what are these people supposed to be doing? Well, someone's got to oversee who's using it, and are you getting out of it what you want to? Now, that might mean, obviously, if you're monetizing your data, are you getting that revenue stream or cost-saving stream? If you're not monetizing it, you're pretending you're monetizing it. So what what other measures are in there to, that you're effective? Now, um, uh, Kelly, to extend your question, in the real world, this would be a QA manager or a QC manager, um, and your your cost accountants would be mon would be monitoring these things. Um, mm -hmm. Managing all the other numbers would be any of your uh, metrics that are affected by this. Um, and any of your business uh, impacts would, that would be affected by a data supply chain. Then your customer, uh, um, we, we put in kind of a supply chain basic four-step. There's a basic four-step that uh, you can use to kind of simplify your view of customer data, and that's engage, transact, fulfill, service. Those are pretty four fundamental uh, functions that go on with a customer. Think about those in terms of pretending that you're monetizing or selling or creating a product? How are you going to engage that downstream consumer? How are you going to do business with them? How do you know, how do you fulfill 
your business with them? And then what is the service after the sale? What are those, what do you do in terms of supplying an analytical model to somebody to make sure that they're happy, they got what they wanted, and it's working and you don't need to adjust? Or if you do need to adjust, how do you, what is that mechanism to make the adjustments? And then lastly, again, we're going to go back to alignment here. You know, um, uh, it's real important with a data supply chain eventually in a really mature organization develops peer status. That is, you strive to become right up there, sitting at the table with finance, legal, and other products and revenue streams. Any organization that says they're going to monetize their data through analytics, even if it means cost savings, needs to be at the table with those other folks. Simple business reason. You're making an impact on the income statement and the balance sheet. Why would you not be there? Why would someone be asking you to give me a better, improve my income statement, but you're not at the table with legal finance and your product or revenue streams, marketing, sales, et cetera? All right. You, so those are, those are definitely some responsibilities that you want to be able to embrace as you advance this data supply chain, especially with the analytical models that we've been talking about here in this series. Yeah, you know, I really like this um, concept of engage, transact, fulfill, service. Because I think part of what we hear in other um, uh, webinars, I'm surprised it hasn't come up here, because it usually comes up at least once in every webinar, is, well, how do you get the support of this? How do you get the, um, the buy-in? And then how do you sustain that over time? And I think that this idea of engaging with a data consumer as a customer and then transacting with them, fulfilling the requirements, servicing them. I think it's a nice way to think about maintaining relevance to mm -hmm. those data consumers and to those business people over time to ensure that you're focusing your um, data program or your data service um, to the needs of the customer in a way yep. that is uh, sustaining the fact that you have multiple customers, so understanding that it's not just a single customer. Abs, 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 absolutely. So some best practices. Uh, we've talked about this, and we want to kind of drive it home. Sell to suppliers, not consumers. Remember, whatever you're giving that person, they are going to do something with it, especially a report or a results of an analytical model or whatever, uh, to take action. So it's not that, oh, yeah, they're happy with what they got. And that's no. It's did they accomplish what they meant to accomplish, all right? So you're solving their customers' needs, all right? Provide something that they can turn into their own product, all right? Um, develop premium products for those sellers. For one thing, they're willing to pay more. Now, if you're monetizing data, that means I can sell my data or whatever I'm monetizing at a higher price. But that also means if I'm just using this as, a, as an analogy or a motivator, I can also get them to invest more in what I'm doing for them. That doesn't just mean I can get budget for next year's project. What else can I get them to invest? How about their time? All right, how about their energy? Uh, Kelly touched on buy-in uh, on the last slide. This is how you get more buy-in. Folks, I'm helping you do your job. Help me help you do your job, all right? When you start to think about direct-to-consumer um, type thinking, that tends to be very fickle and very high cost. But if I start to think about how can I help you be direct to consumer, I'm now in a much more manageable mindset of, of using data. Um, don't make your customer invest super heavily. If you say, hey, you can use this, but you all got to go to hours of training and days of understanding and understand all these obscure terms I'm about to lay on you, just don't do that. Right? Just don't do that. And then lastly, you know, market scale how quickly. Proof of concepts are good. Uh, we do still, we're doing too many proof of concepts in the 21st century. Folks, this stuff works. When an organization says now, and Kelly, I'm going to want you to weigh in on this one. My, because my glass, Kelly's glass is half full. Mine tends to be half empty a lot of times. Um, when someone says, well, we need a proof of concept, to me, that's resistance to change. That's just a foot dragging exercise because we know this stuff works, uh, you know. And, and um, uh, but you know, make the call if you don't get there sooner. Some other department in many big organizations is going to do their own sandbox and beat you to it, which which gives you a whole bunch of other sets of problems. Okay, um, 
Kelly, exactly. we on that yeah. one. I'll head. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah you know, it's, there is absolutely a case for, um, you know, proof of concepts and, and proving that something exists uh, or something works before investing too heavily. So there, there's absolutely that. There is the danger of analysis paralysis as well. Oh, yeah. And I think when we choose um, the idea around, you know, and then uh, getting back to kind of the concept of the supply chain, right? So you can do a proof of concept to identify like a minimum viable product or a minimum viable state. But once that's mm -hmm. done, then you need to start thinking about how truly is this going to add the most value to the organization? And let's move on because otherwise the, the, um, the other either lines of business or your competitors are going to be leveraging data in those more advanced ways that would enable them to be more productive, more agile and uh, serve your customers better than you can. I, I, I had a conversation um, uh, just accidentally with a very, turned out to be a very astute data scientist uh, the other day. And they said that they were doing their data science thing, but they really still wanted to do the sandbox and, and do stuff and try to answer questions, know what it asked. But they knew that they couldn't do that, that they had to focus on doing this blocking and tackling inside that we just talked about. And their, their question was, should I outsource my R&D, right? To, you know, just total experimentation, get it outside the company, just give them access to the sandbox and let someone play with this and budget for that. I thought that was kind of uh, neat. The other best practice here is Absolutely. integrating with your data strategy. And I'll go through this one uh, quickly because we can get, we have one more uh, panel to get to and then we have to leave time for our questions. Um, all of these uh, information as a service and ecosystems, everything's intertwined, all right? You're going to share data. You've got to have a data strategy of how to deal with all this. It's a win-win. I mean, when someone says, well, we don't have a data strategy and we're in there doing work with them, whatever it is we're doing, we go, oh, boy, because we end up kind of backing into a data strategy. That you just can't help but not do it. Metadata, got to have it. It's your inventory management system. It is, a, you're not going to build a factory and just kind of throw everything out on the floor and say, if you need it, go find it. But by goodness, that's how we do our data. So obviously, you, that's kind of a, a no-brainer on that one, right? The data landscape, where is all this stuff? Take a good inventory, even once a year, even a factory. It was my first real corporate job where I got paid enough that I could feed myself. I was a, I was a plant accountant. And I would have to go out every six months and just count stuff because even with the best systems, you still have to, to count it. And we would always find a pile of stuff that we didn't know we had, right? And you're going to find that with, with your data. And then the last thing with data strategy, culture has your strategy for lunch. When you're going to integrate with your data strategy, integrate with your culture because none of this stuff will go down smoothly. That's just the way of the world. People don't really uh, go with it um, as easily as you'd like them to. Kelly, anything? I guess not. We'll continue on here. Um, let me make sure is somebody there. Shannon and I, I make sure I didn't lose the conference here. No, you're still there. Okay. All righty. Thank you. All righty. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, we might have lost Kelly then. All right. How analytics now? Let's. Where are your analytics going to sit here? Typical place. End of the supply chain. All right. I have my landing zone, my standardization, my analytics platforms. I'm analyzing everything's coming to the end. What do we have? Boom. Let's take a look at it. That's great. That's wonderful. We are all thinking of this, but there's another thing that we're where you're going to see more and more and more of, especially as AI and machine learning comes in, and that is with the Internet of Things and machine learning, that analytics and that data supply chain is going to drop into our analytics environments earlier. In fact, the data supply chain and analytics is not analytics at the end of the supply chain. So the last takeaway here for our talk here today is this, this analytics can in, intercept the supply chain at any spot. So if you've got some Internet of Things going on or a lot of data or a lot of sensor data, we're going to address a question here in a little bit about healthcare. Um, your data supply chain is feeding, dropping into analytics anywhere along that way. 
It's just not at the end. So don't assume that you know you're at the back end of, of everything that's going on. There's a lot of opportunities to drop uh, IoT data, sensor data, just lots and lots of transactions. Excuse me, <clears throat> it's a rough day today <clears throat> here with my voice. Um, uh, at, at the end, it's, you're going to have some stuff at the, at the beginning. Uh, so at, uh, is Kelly back yet? I don't see Kelly yet. So let's just do our takeaways and then we'll hit the questions here. Uh, we, yeah, Kelly's dropped. He's going to dial back in. Um, <clears throat> the uh, um, uh, let's see here. Best practices. I just was checking my phone and uh, Kelly's going to dial back in. Janet. Um, she had a technical issue. Um, there are many uses of data. All right, it's coming from everywhere. Um, this metaphor will help you balance all of that. You're just making your supply chain more complicated. It's not the end of the world. Just build a better supply chain, all right? Um, all of these uh, disciplines of lean management logistics uh, are models in the non-data world that we can use in data management. There is a strong case to be made that data management really isn't new. It's the same stuff, just a different subject, okay? Um, the endpoint is your data lake. Your endpoint is insights and monetizing your data. But that can happen anywhere along the supply chain, all right? And your supply chain should be obviously data requirements driven, but fully exploit that whole assembly line metaphor. Raw data in, raw data out is a sophisticated product and have a mindset that you're selling this stuff to somebody even if you're not. And of course, we have our well-established processes along the way, metadata, data catalogs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I want to hit the questions here, and Kelly, you can jump in as soon as you uh, can. Uh, what, one question here is, I love this analogy you presented. I didn't have to say that to answer the question, but that was really cool. All right. Um, what are some ways in which you could use a concept in the healthcare sector? And they mentioned their employer, which is a very large, well-known healthcare company. Um, healthcare is perfect for the data supply chain because you have so many sources of data. You have the clerk that's typing into a terminal. You have sensor data from um, uh, all the medical devices that are out there. You have external data from other episodes of care for that same patient. You also have external data in terms of psychographic and demographic and geographic type influencers of people's health. So uh, the healthcare is a perfect metaphor that in a really good, strong healthcare provider, if you engineer a good data supply chain and feed your various data feeds into this supply chain and just manage that really well so that any point along the way you know where it is, what it is, and how it got there, you can drop analytics in anywhere along the way of that without a whole lot of muss or fuss. And in fact, we're working with healthcare organizations as we speak in exactly this type of process. So I hope that answered your questions there. Um, uh, we have a couple more here. Uh, um, one question came in. I, we kind of touched on this, but maybe they join late. Does the data supply chain handle data quality? Uh, and yeah, that's a fundamental uh, element of the data supply chain. Um, and the next one, and Kelly, maybe you can weigh in on this one if you're out there. Um, this seems like a complicated metaphor. Um, will my management really get this? And um, I, I, don't, I think it is a, a, a better man, metaphor for management. I think it's more realistic than saying I need a data architecture, which gives you in your head any number of things that pops into your head. Um, we have used similar analogies at many clients of, a, of an information factory where we build the final product, especially with analytics. Um, so we, it's a very powerful um, metaphor. I think it's easier on management than, than, than harder. I, re I really do. Um, we're, we're getting yeah, towards I mean, the top I here. There you that, go. There's yeah. Kelly. Yay. <laughs> yeah. So I think that there might be some industries where it might not play. Um, so there is probably some some limitation, but I think the the point of doing an analogy like this 
is to conversation grounded in something that the organization is fundamentally familiar with. And so a data supply chain and a manufacturing supply chain um, you know, have some great analogies. So if you're not a manufacturing organization or if there's not the concept of a supply chain within your organization, there might be another sort of value chain, if you will, that does resonate. And so it might be an opportunity for you to use that metaphor within your specific industry. Um, for example, the um, uh, we also do a lot of work in financial services, and, and one of the one of our clients talks a lot about how the data governance organizations just helping the organization have a fiduciary viewpoint of their data, right? So fiduciary responsibility goes over really well with banks and asset management companies. So again, you might have an analogy that you mm -hmm. can pick up, and if you do, we would love to hear about it. Yes, and at that, or I've always wanted to say this on that bombshell. Um, Shannon, uh, Shannon, I think we're done. And yes, I think that's most profound. That you have a metaphor like this in your company, no matter what you do, right? So, um, Shannon, back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Shannon, Thanks, guys. There. That's a great presentation. Um, and just a reminder to answer the most commonly asked question to for the attendees, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this presentation with links to the slides, links to the recording of the session. Um, and thanks again, everybody, for the participa participation, and we'll hope to see you next month. Thanks, John and Kelly. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.